Now at this time, let us prepare our hearts for worship. I'm reading from Psalm 147, verses 1 through 6. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines a number of stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble, but casts the wicked to the ground. Now I invite you to stand as you are able and join with me in our call to worship. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. For the word of the Lord is upright. And all his work is done in faithfulness. Our opening hymn is hymn number 117, O oh God, our help in ages past.
May the peace of Christ be with you. Now let us greet one another in Christ's love.
I want to invite our children to come forward for our children's moment. I'm reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verses 1 through 9. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? 
Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. It's good to see you here today. I wanted to share with you, uh, because sometimes I don't think we hear the the good that's happening, uh, and and we just kind of get distracted or or it's not communicated well. And so I say this not as a means for us to be proud or to brag, but just to know what our church is engaged in. This was a great week in the life of uh, First United Methodist and the ministry we do uh, with, with our project transformation every day this week, going into Nashville and and reading to children and helping them with their literacy. We know that's a, a way, a literacy is a way for people to cha- change their lives and to help their get their education better. Uh, and so that was a huge thing. We also had yesterday a team go out and work all day in that uh, amazing heat and the, just the awful heat and humidity, uh, building a habitat house with our community build to help make sure that another family has a home to be able to live in and to be safe in and secure and build a house, uh, build a home in. And so what a, what a great work that did. And then this week also, in our mustard seed garden out there, we brought in our first fruits uh, out of it. And so it's kind of neat to see it coming in. Uh, and we're having that team weigh what they pull out before they take it over to the help center. And they, they took 50 pounds of produce this week over to the help center just in the first week that it was out. Uh, and, and the people over there said that the, the folks who come in looking for food love the fresh produce. And we've got squash and zucchini and cucumbers that were coming in this week. And, and they said they're just gone like that whenever they go out. And so what a great thing. And that's just the first week of our, of our community garden to have 50 pounds of produce. And we were out in it last night, and there's a whole bunch of little cantaloupes and things like that that are going. So it's just going to be a fun summer of being able to share, you know, healthy, wholesome, fresh fruits and vegetables uh, with our community through that. So good stuff happening this week. And I just wanted to share that. Uh, and that's, that's the work of the church. That's the work that you and I, that we're called to do together. And so I'm so thankful for that. Today, uh, we are continuing on our Blockbuster series. I think most of you figured it out. And, and for some of you, you may not know, if you're getting your clues each week, we're giving clues out as to what it may be and letting you guess. If you're getting your clues from, say, Facebook, and you're not sure you're getting them right, you should turn to uh, Twitter or Instagram because all three of those have clues and they're different clues. And so if you're not getting it from one, go to another and you can get some extra clues to kind of help you out uh, in that process. But I think most of you got it this week. I heard more people saying they had it coming in today than than on any of the other movies so far. Uh, Our movie is Forrest Gump, and it was released in 1994. That's the same year, actually, as Lion King, which we did last week. Uh, and it grossed uh, almost $700 million at the box office in 1994. It was nominated for uh, 13 Academy Awards, won six of those Academy Awards, including Best Picture, uh, Best Director, and Best Actor, Tom Hanks, uh, the best lead actor in, in his portrayal of Forrest Gump. But, but more than that, more than the, the blockbuster that it was, more than winning Best Picture for that year, it became a cultural phenomenon like few movies ever achieved. It intersected our lives, it intersected our history, and it actually impacted our culture around us. And we know that, that through that, there are a whole bunch of, of uh, vernacular that was generated through this movie that became part of our normal conversation, and normal language, sayings and things that we use. And we'll come back to that in a minute. If, if you haven't seen it, uh, the movie is about a character named Forrest Gump, played by Tom Hanks, who has a low IQ. Uh, 75 is his IQ. A lot of people call him stupid. We're going to come back to that again in a minute. Um, but, but he always ends up finding himself at the right place at the right time. And, and, and his life intersects history in powerful ways to the 60s, 70s, and 80s. He meets every president during that time frame. He meets living legends in sports and music and other things during that period. And he always seems to be at any major world event having a positive impact on that event through his life and presence. Everything seems to work out great for Forrest Gump. 
And so as a way of kind of introducing this and reminding us of this, we do have a little montage of some of Forrest Gump's best sayings from the movie. Uh, if you'd like to quote them along with it, you're welcome to, but watch this. Do you want a chocolate? I could eat about a million and a half of these. My mom always said life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Now, my mom always told me that miracles happen every day. Some people don't think so, but they do. saying shrimp is the fruit of the sea you can barbecue it boil it broil it bake it saute it there's on um, shrimp kebabs shrimp creole shrimp gumbo pan fried deep fried stir fried there's pineapple shrimp lemon shrimp coconut shrimp pepper shrimp shrimp soup shrimp stew shrimp salad shrimp and potatoes shrimp burger Shrimp sandwich. That's that's about it. Are you stupid or something? I'm as stupid as a stupid does. Are you crazy? Or just plain stupid? Stupid as stupid does, Mrs. Blue. I guess. Are you stupid or something? Stupid as a stupid does, sir. I'm not a smart man, but I know what love is. That's all I have to say about that. So this movie is about Forrest Gump and how he lives his life, but equally as important to the movie are the people that he interacts with and that are a part of his life that influence him, most notably people like Bubba, that he learned the shrimping industry from, that he eventually created a shrimping empire out of, uh, of course, Lieutenant Dan, uh, who was a key figure in helping him to stay alive while he was in Vietnam. And then there was Forrest Jenna. Jenny is the person outside of his mother that Forrest loved the most in this world. And as much as this movie is about Forrest, it is also about Jenny. And as much as this movie is about how everything always seems to work out for Forrest Gump, this movie is also about how difficult and hard life is for Jenny. We learned early on that when Jenny was growing up, her father was an alcoholic. And he was physically and sexually abusive of her. And that created a deep pain in her life. A deep void that we know throughout the movie Jenny tried to fill in all sorts of ways through alcohol, drugs, men, and anything else that could either cause it or forget that would try to fill that void or that would at least take the edge off of the extreme pain that Jenny felt. We know this led her down a path because of the choices she made trying to feel the hurt from the pain of a choice that was made without her permission against her. Eventually in the movie, broken, beaten down, and hopeless, Jenny doesn't know where else to turn and so she goes home. And there she finds Forrest welcoming her back in with open arms, loving her unconditionally, not concerned with the choices and the past and the consequences of those choices that she had made. There's one more clip that I want you to watch from this movie, and it's after Jenny had come home and she and Forrest are there and they go out on a walk one day and they find themselves out by Jenny's home that she grew up in. 
It's sort of a spiritual journey of sorts for her, though not in a good way, because it brings back a lot of pain and brokenness for her. Watch this clip. Every day we take a walk, and I'd jab her on like a monkey in a tree, and she'd listen about ping-ponging and shrimping and mama making a trip up to heaven. I did all the talking. Jenny most of the time was, was real quiet. Sometimes, I guess there just aren't enough rocks. There just aren't enough rocks. And for Jenny, that was the explanation of her life. That was the statement that encompassed who she was. There was a lot of pain and a lot of brokenness and a lot of hurt, and there just weren't enough rocks to make all of those wrongs right. We know that later on in the movie, uh, after Jenny had died, Forrest using the money that he made from his Apple computer stock, which did pretty well, and, <laughs> and his Bubba Gump shrimping company, he bought that house and had a bulldozer demolishing it, sort of giving some justice to Jenny's past. We like this movie because we love seeing someone like Forrest Gump, someone so pure, so kind, so genuine, succeed. But there's also a piece of this movie that we're drawn to, whether we'll admit it or not, because we see ourselves in Jenny. We see that she, like us, have pain from things in our past, things that have been done to us, maybe that we had no control over, but also there are those things in our past, things, those skeletons in our closet that, that we have from choices that we've made and consequences that we've had to bear or, or consequences that we're still worried we may have to endure yet. And so we, like Jenny, understand what it's like to deal with a broken past, with a void that just can't seem to be filled and so we're drawn to that imagery and we're drawn to her and we understand what it's like to go through life, maybe having to make and deal with the, the consequences of our choices. I want you to stop just for a minute and still yourselves and think just between you and God, what are those voids in your life? What is that brokenness that you feel? What are those skeletons that you have in your closet? The pain that you just can't seem to dull? What is it in your life that there just aren't enough rocks to be able to address, to be able to deal with? be able to work through, to come out on the other side of. I wish I knew more about the man that we read about in our scripture today. 
We don't know a whole lot about him. What we do know is that he had had an affliction that he had been dealing with for 38 years. Whether that was all of his life or only a part of his life, we don't know. But it had left him partially paralyzed, unable to get around uh, at some level. We don't know the full extent of that, but it had caused him great pain. We do know that. And we know that for an extended period of time, maybe for that whole 38 years, if not for many, many years, he had come and surrounded himself with other people who were, had similar situations, who were sick, who were diseased, who were blind, who were paralyzed. Others who had come to this pool called Bethesda because an old wives' tale had said that when the pool was stirred, that that meant there were healing properties that were present. And if you could get yourself into the water at that moment, then you could be healed from your affliction, whatever that was. And so this man had given of himself, putting his hope in the stirring of the pool that he might be able to find hope and healness through that. To no avail, I might add with no understanding that any of that was true, but that was the only hope that he had that he held on to. And what we do know about him as well is that Jesus came to him on this one particular day and he asked the man, do you want to be well? And the man was almost offended that Jesus would ask him that because he said, of course I want to be well. Why else would I be out here? Why else would I have given up on any other chance at life I had and be here surrounded by all of these people except that I want to be well and I want to get into that pool whenever it stirs so that I can walk again. But every time it stirred up, people cut me off, they push me aside, they knock me down. No one wants to help me. Everybody's only concerned with themselves. They're acting selfishly, and so I can't ever get in the water. Of course I want to be well. Why do you think I'm here? I want to stop for a minute and just talk about these two images that we have before us. One, the image of Jenny from Forrest Gump, and one, the image of this man beside the pool at Bethesda. I see a lot of similarities in these two. Jenny had had some evil thing done to her when she was a young child. And the fact that it happened to one person is evil, and the fact that it happened so prevalent in our society is just tragic that we will take advantage of the vulnerable in our culture like that, in our world like that, is just awful. And because of that event, it changed her, and it changes everyone who have had to endure such abuse. And because of that, it created that void, that, that pain that she was constantly trying to fill, oftentimes making poor choices that carried with them significant consequences. Ultimately, it led to Jenny's death as she acquired HIV and died of AIDS. For this man, it says that he was an invalid. Was he born with it? Was it some kind of genetic disease that constantly was deteriorating his body? We don't know. But what we know is that he suffered with it for 38 years, probably by... Um, Probably in those moments it was done as a way of, of him trying to find healing. That through that 38 years he suffered with it. And it was of no doing of his own that he was there. And he was in the midst of it trying to find something that would give him hope. Something that would help him to fill the void that was in his life. And the pain in which he had, he would do anything to stop it. And so he had bought into this wives' tale. It's the only hope he had. And in the midst of it, he had an encounter with Jesus. In the midst of this broken and evil world, and we know that evil lurks around every corner in this world. 
And its stated mission is to steal, kill, and destroy, and it does a great job of it. And it takes the brokenness and selfishness and depravity of this world and uses it to its advantage. But time and time again through Scripture, we see Jesus tell people that he came so that we may have life and that we may have it more abundantly. And we know that as Jesus sat, he listened to the frustrations of this man answer the question from Jesus, do you want to be well? And Jesus never acknowledged the wife's tale and its legitimacy or lack thereof that he was espousing, but he listened to what the man said. And then after the man finished, he took him back to his original question, do you want to be well? And he looked at him. And he said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And in that moment, I dare say that there was something in that man that changed. And he recognized that the hope that he had placed in the pool at Bethesda was not authentic. But standing in front of him, there was the epitome of hope. The very definition of what hope was. And he began to stand up. For the first time in 38 years. Perhaps the first time in his life. And he picked up his mat. And he went home. Friends. Here's the thing. There are not enough rocks in this world to make all of the wrongs right. There are not enough rocks to make all of the brokenness that we experience and that we see around us okay. There are not enough rocks in this world to cover up for the things that have been done to us by others and the pain that it has caused us at times for the hurt that we have experienced out of it. There's not enough rocks to fill the void at times that we feel in our lives. Not enough rocks to take care of all the skeletons that we have in our closet. Not enough rocks to deal with the consequences of the poor choices that we've made in our lives at times. There aren't enough rocks. But there is one rock. The rock of Christ Jesus. who is continually seeking you and me out and offering us life and life abundantly. Despite the poor choices that have been made against us, despite the poor choices that we have made, despite the far off lands and the pigsties that we found ourselves in, Jesus continues to pursue us and continues to offer us life and to counteract the one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. In the movie, when Jenny got to her wit's end, when she didn't know up from down and didn't know where to turn and was totally hopeless in every sense of the way, she decided she was going to go home. And there she found Jesus waiting for her. It was Forrest Gump in that moment. And Forrest welcomed her in with open arms and showed her what unconditional love was. And Jesus offers that same thing for you and for me, no matter where we've been, no matter what we've experienced, No matter the poor choices done to us and the poor choices we've done, no matter the consequences of those choices, Jesus has never once given up on you and never will. And he's always welcoming you home with open arms, giving you love unconditional, giving you life abundantly. In the world to come, yes, but saying even though you've been invalid, even though you've been limited for 38 years, 
I still want to give you life today, a new life. And he speaks life into your life and my life. That's the rock that matters. That's the good news that Jesus Christ offers. That's the rock that our very faith is built on. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our song of response will be on the screen. It'll be in your hymnal as well if you'd like to read it there. It's a song of praise. Uh, For the 80 years that it's been in existence, it's been a reminder to us that no matter how difficult life may seem, that there will always be victory in Jesus. And I invite you to stand as you're able and sing with me. These are our prayer concerns this morning. Health concerns for Dee Dee, Dad. Prayer for family of Bill Gwaltney. Praise and prayers for our expanding family. Prayers for my aunt, recent surgery to remove a cancerous tumor. Praise to God for the miracles and blessings he has bestowed on all of us and for this beautiful weekend. Amelia Gibson, Aaron Jones family, the Hibden family, traveling grandchildren, Betty Westmoreland, healing for all from surgery, love to the Jimmy Hodge family, 
Congratulations to Mark McDearman, who will be playing in the Amateur US, U.S. Open Tournament. Virginia McDonald, Ray Steves, Nancy Ferretta, our country. Prayer for our daughter and the safe delivery of her baby this week. Prayers for relatives traveling in Egypt. Prayers for a friend, Tanya. Prayers for Gabby and her friends at Vanderbilt who have cancer. Gary, Jeff, Leonard and Donna Guild, Barbara Webb, Debbie Roberts, Don Price, Pat Wingo, Charles Hayes family, the Jim Barrett family, Holly Hudlow, Gabby Alls, safety for family trips. Diane Halliburton, Ernest Lampley, VBS Week. Nellie Kashia, Shelley Buckingham, Donna Buckingham, Susan Gully, Donna Sloan, Lydia Bain, Gabby Alls, Ron Smith, James Fannin. Prayers and thanks to God for my daughter Erin and granddaughter Sophie moving to Lebanon, Tennessee. And today is my daughter Erin's birthday. Jean Van Peterson, Ernest Cotton, Christianity, Donald O'Rourke. Let us lift up these concerns this morning as we come to our prayer time. You may pray where you are. You may come and kneel at the right chancel rail for prayer. You may come and kneel at the left chancel rail for prayer and for pastoral prayer and anointing. tithes and our offerings.
As you leave here, may the love of God, the fellowship of Jesus Christ, and the grace of the Holy Spirit lead, guide, and be with you.